This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, with Pete Seeger, Oren Lyons, and Andy Major. Pete? And Oren Lyons is one of the wisest men in the world, this Onondaga leader. I've heard him speak on different occasions, and I've come away and said, how I wish this man could be heard by everybody in America, everybody in the world. He's a wise man. How did the two of you meet Pete and Oren? He came to speak for the Clearwater Annual Meeting, the little, uh, little organization we have trying to clean up the Hudson River. And he came to speak to us. And he, when I heard it, I said, this man, this man should be heard by everybody. Oren Lyons, on this Indigenous Peoples Day, what are your thoughts you'd like to share with our viewers and listeners and readers around the world? Well, as I listen to, uh, <clears throat> to Pete Singh, uh, recognizing the, the spirit uh, in all of us, the spirit is uh, powerful, and the will, the will to, to continue and, and do what has to be done, the responsibility for adults to act like adults, for leaders to act like leaders, and to take away uh, from the corporate powers that are currently in charge of the direction of this earth and return it back to the people where it belongs and also to protect, uh, really be responsible for seven generations of uh, life coming. That's uh, our mission. That's my mission. It's always been our mission. The mission is peace. The mission is forever. And uh, the mission is friendship. And to understand that the human family is a family. It doesn't matter what color you are. You can change blood. You can't get any closer than that. And people should understand that. Um. What does it mean to be the faith keeper of the Onondaga Nation? And tell us the history of the Onondaga. The Onondaga Nation was the central fire that the uh, peacemaker had to deal with. Uh, the Tadadaho was the fiercest of all people. And um, he changed that man. He changed that man. And that, that, is, that uh, proves that no one is above redemption. I don't care what you do, you can change. And that was a severe lesson to everybody. We remember that. So um, today, the Tadadaho said Hill will be up here meeting and greeting with the people and uh, carrying these words of peace. Um, over a thousand years ago, he was the fiercest, the fiercest enemy of peace. And so the ideas of democracy, the ideas of uh, leadership by the people and for the people, those are old words. Those belong to our confederation and we're, we're taken on by, uh, by the new government. I, um, I think they stalled in, in uh, several places, but the uh, essence is still there. The essence is still there, but it needs the work of the people. The people have to stand. The people have to move. And it's they hold the power. They hold the authority, and always did and always will. So they have to understand that. So as long as you're waiting for somebody to tell you to do something, you're going to wait a long time. The significance of the Idle No More movement in Canada? Oh, yes. Can you explain what it is? Well, it's uh, four women, uh, three Indian women and one white woman who just uh, said, this is enough. We're not going to stand by. We're not going to be idle no more. And they challenged the leadership of uh, Canada. And uh, Prime Minister Harper has really challenged the uh, future of people in opening up this, uh, this huge uh, uh, open pit mining, uh, you know, that uh, Keystone Pipeline is, is so intent. All about commerce, nothing about the future. And so they took a stand, and they said, we're not idle anymore. And of course, the media never never followed it, but it went around the world, and there are people around the world responding to that. Uh, it's a grassroots movement, and it's a, a lesson in what you can do if you make your stand. And so that's what common people do, lock their arms and stand. Mm -hmm. 
Andy Major, uh, Reuters is reporting Chesapeake Energy has abandoned a two-year legal battle to retain leases on thousands of acres of land in New York where planned to drill for natural gas using, you know, the controversial technique known as fracking, provided the state lift a ban on the practice. Uh, do you know about this and what the significance of this is? Uh, it was announced to our camp that they were abandoning the leases a couple of days ago, not with that last caveat about New York State lifting the moratorium. So obviously we would oppose the lifting of the moratorium. We welcome their, them abandoning the leases and stopping harassing the people of New York State to try to get them to allow this drilling technique. Um, to, to get back to what Oren was saying, you know, the purpose of this journey down the Hudson and the larger campaign of which it's a part is to sow seeds to build a social movement, a movement powerful enough to compel New York State and the United States to live up to these treaties and in doing so to honor the earth. And we have been uh, overjoyed by the response we've received all the way down the Hudson River from individual citizens, from local government leaders and civic organizations welcoming what we're doing, providing support, uh, aligning with this broader mission that we need to honor the treaties that we have signed, to live up to them after 400 years, and to work together for a better future. So we welcome people to join with us today at the pier, in the future, through our website, Facebook, et cetera, because this is not, this landing in New York is in some ways the ending of the paddling journey, but the beginning of a broader movement that we'll be looking for support from progressive people far and wide to, to engage in. Pete Seeger, I wanted to get your assessment of President Obama. I mean, look at this moment in time. You sang at his inauguration, that remarkable moment, this land is your land. Um, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Um, actually, President Obama will be standing in the same place as Dr. King did when he delivered his speech and will give a speech on August 28th um, in front of the Lincoln Memorial. You were not at the March on Washington, were you? No, I took my family, uh, my wife and I took uh, three children out of school, and in ten and a half months, we visited 28 countries around the world. Small countries, we visited Samoa in the Pacific, and then Australia, Indonesia, and her father joined us. For, he saw his own family again for the first time in 50 years. He helped the American war effort. He did very dangerous things. Uh, he, he wrote to Washington right after Pearl Harbor, says, the only hope for Japan is to get rid of the militarists, because fascists had taken over Japan just like they took over Germany. Where did you hear about Dr. King's speech, I Have a Dream? Do you remember? I read it. I'm a readaholic. And, so somewhere in that journey. And he was surely one of the most astonishing speakers in the world. Did you ever get to meet him? I met him only twice. Once, very briefly, when he, uh, just a year after the bus boycott, where he first became well known. In Montgomery? Uh, no, he came to the little school in the highlands of Tennessee, called the Highlander Folk School. And uh, that's where he heard me sing, We Shall Overcome. And then I was singing a few songs in the street outside the United Nations <coughs> when he made perhaps the most, one of the two most important speeches. He said, I have to face the fact that my own country is the greatest purveyor of violence. We must get out of Vietnam, and I'm sure I have absolutely— You were at Riverside Church, April 4th, 1967? Uh, no, I was in the streets where he gave the same speech a, a day later outside the United Nations. And uh, I was up on the speaker stand when I saw a black car inching its way through the crowd, and I heard people say, he's here, he's here. He got 20 feet away from the speaker stand, and the door opened, and Dr. King got out. It took six strong men to help him to make it possible for him to make 20 feet from the car 
to the speaker stand. I said, how can anybody live with this kind of adulation? Well, I'm sure I have absolutely no proof, but I think that's when uh, LBJ lost his temper. He said, after all I did for that guy, look what he does to me. He probably picked up the phone to J. Edgar Hoover and said, do what you want, slam. What was Dr. King's reaction to hearing you sing We Shall Overcome at the Highlander Center? <laughs> oh, he was sitting in the back seat of a car while a, uh, a woman I know, wonderful uh, woman, was driving him to some a speaking engagement up in Kentucky. He said, We Shall Overcome. That really song really sticks with you, doesn't it? <laughs> he. Uh, at only age 14, uh, some man wrote a letter to the big newspaper in Atlanta. Uh, why do Negroes want to marry white? Don't they know that we're supposed to be separate people? And this 14-year-old writes a letter to the editor of the, of the newspaper. Surely Mr. So-and-so, whoever wrote this letter, must know that if there are people in America of mixed ancestry, it's not because Negroes want to marry whites, but because of aggressive white males taking advantage of defenseless black females. In one sentence, he said what most people would have taken paragraphs to say. That was Martin Luther King when he was 14 years old. Yeah. What is your assessment of President Obama? I wish that he had made so few compromises that he would not have gotten reelected. And then, four years later, he would have gotten reelected because the contrast between what he did and the people who took over for the four years in between would have been obvious to the whole world. Well, I know that you all have to go to the pier to meet the rowers who are coming up the Hudson, we but I was do. wondering if you could take us out on a song, maybe the Hammer song, If I Had a Hammer, which was <laughs> sung by Peter, Paul, and Mary at the uh, March on Washington, your song, um, 50 years ago, August 28th. Well, Woody Guthrie was one of the greatest songwriters I knew, but the bass and the weavers a man named Lee Hayes from Arkansas was another one of the geniuses, and he knew that a lot of old gospel songs just change one word and you got a new verse. So he sent me four verses, says, Pete, can you make up a tune? I tried to, but it wasn't as good a tune as it should have been, and Peter, Paul, and Mary improved my tune, and then the song went around the world. Uh, Marlena Dietrich. Uh, toured the world, if uh, and no, oh, she she sang where all the flowers gone. But the song, if I had a hammer, uh, went all sorts of places that I could never go, and uh, I'm very glad. If I had a hammer, a hammer in the mole. A hammer in the evening, all over this land. A hammer out danger, hammer out a warning, hammer out love between all of my brothers. Oh, a woman said, make that my brothers and my sisters. Lee says it doesn't roll off the tongue so well, but she insisted. He said, how about all of my siblings? She didn't think that was funny. Oh, 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 for this land. If I had a song, don't need to sing the whole song. You can sing it to yourself, whether you're driving a car, or washing the dishes, or uh, just uh, singing to your kids. We haven't mentioned children much on this program, but it may be. Children realizing that you can't live without love, you can't live without fun and laughter, 
you can't live without friends. And uh, I say, long live teachers of children, because they can show children how they can save the world. Can we end with where have all the flowers gone for the children? Mm -hmm. No, you sing it. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to end on a lovely note. <laughs> no. no I've, I've sung lots of songs, and uh, the other day I, uh, a group of Japanese Americans uh, remembered Hiroshima, and I sang four short verses. We come and stand at every door, but none can hear my silent tread. I knock and yet remain unseen, for I am dead, for I am dead. I'm only seven, although I died in Hiroshima long ago. I'm seven now, as I was then. When children die, they do not grow. My hair was scorched by swirling flame. My eyes grew dim, my eyes grew blind. Death came and turned my bones to dust, and that was scattered by the wind. I, I need no fruit, I need no rice, I need no sweets, not even bread. I ask for nothing for myself, for I am dead, for I am dead. All that I ask is that for peace. You fight today, you fight today, so that the children of this world may live and grow and laugh and play. Pete, thank you so much, and especially on this day, August 9th, the anniversary of the bombing of Nagasaki 68 years ago, three days after the bombing of Hiroshima 68 years ago. Yeah. And now you head to greet the rowers coming down the Hudson, and I thank you so much yeah. for being with us. Pete Seeger, Oren Lyons, Andy Major, thanks for oh, giving thank us you. this thank gift you. today.